All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another episode here with Amazic.com. We're trying to do uh, in-depth tech interviews where we talk to some of the experts from the industry and get the, their perspective on uh, the products that they work with and the, the industry and the space that they work in. And today as well, we've got a treat for you. We've got Gil Langston with us. He's the senior product manager at Jump Cloud, and he comes with a lot of experience. And uh, he's here to talk to us today about what Jump Cloud specializes in, which is uh, directory as a service, and identity and access management, SSO, and device management as well. So that's a lot. So there's a lot uh, that that goes into all of that, and he's going to be breaking it down little by little as we go through the interview. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's an adjust gill for you. Uh, so we're really looking forward to uh, getting to know more about what you do, Gil, and what Jump Cloud does. So thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me today. Great. Uh, and uh, yeah, just before we start off, just uh, you know to mention, uh, you can head over to amazic.com, A-M-A-Z-I-C.com to watch uh, many more uh, interviews like this and even uh, read up on a lot of news articles follow events there's a lot of stuff that we're doing on this front so if, if this if you like what you you, you hear here what you see here go to amazic.com all right with that uh, we'll get started with our interview with gil um so gil uh you know uh, you know when i when i think of you know identity access and you know, all of these things uh, a lot of times it's the news headlines that comes to my mind because you know recently there's been a lot of uh, you know unfortunate incidents of uh, you know a lot of companies getting just hacked you know big data breaches uh, you know it's really unfortunate and you know what's what's your first impression when you read these headlines what do you think what goes through your mind well you know the first thing I always think of is that you know if you think about what bad actors do in the history of of how you know hacking and and just bad actors and infiltration has kind of developed over the years. They they always change their tactics based mm -hmm. on you know this the the different measures that are put in place and they figure out a new way. So it's always a cat and mouse who's ahead, who's behind. Um, you know, these kind of things will always happen. Um, they'll continue to happen. You know, what I think is important is is how as an organization, um, wh whoever is the one who's breached reacts to it, uh, what they learn from it and how they improve, but also how they communicate. Um, and then also from, you know, an organization who might be affected by this, it's also equally as important to make sure that you have a plan in place uh, when something like this occurs, that you can, you know, understand the impact, mitigate, um, you know, anything that, that might have come from this, this breach. But, you know, today, and we're going to talk about this a lot today, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure, uh, it's all about the identity, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, with, with the changes that we've seen in the past, you know, let's say five years, let's not even talk about since the pandemic, let's just say the, the five to eight years, how, mm -hmm. how things have shifted towards identity being the core thing you have to protect versus, you know, the, the four walls and everything else. And we're going to continue to see this and we're going to continue to see uh, innovations on the side of identity, um, you know, and the access management that follows behind that identity. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, yeah, it's it's something that you always have to expect and plan for. Um, you know that if you read the NIST publication about zero trust, uh, one of the things they talk about is always assume breach. And you know, and I think that's important. I think you should always operate in an environment where uh, you know it's not enough to say I need some trigger that makes me investigate have I been breached. It's it's mm -hmm. always and constantly uh, evaluating your current posture and assume the breach and try to find it. So yeah, we're going to keep seeing these happen. Uh, the impacts are far and wide. You know, I understand you're going to see more and more regulation about these things. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you'll, you'll see new papers being published and new requirements uh, from different compliance regulations. But at the end of the day, it's really always about understanding your exposure, taking actions to mitigate that, and then having a plan for what to do when in, invariably it does, you know, at some point uh, result in a breach. Yeah. And the stakes are so high now, you know, like you said, uh, you know, if you go back five years ago and now, you know, it's totally different. Uh, the stakes are so much more higher now. Uh, you know, it's just like a ripple effect. It's like dominoes, you know, and uh, one one falls and it affects so many organizations. So, you know, could you walk us through, uh, you know, a typical breach or takeover and, uh, you know, could you an attack and 
could you tell us, you know, how does it start? What's the typical ways it starts, and you know, how does it progress, and what sort of the yeah the journey of an attack? If you could sort of outline that for us. So I used to love to to do some research into these things and and you know look into those and uh, understand the way they work. I actually know people that work in in those fields, the penetration and and you know the 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 good guys uh, that are doing mm -hmm. it, of course, um, to <laughs> to kind of prove out people's security. But I, you know it, we were talking about the way things have changed in the past few years. Even if you look back, you know to to when I started my tech career. Uh, how simple things were then, um, you know, it was all about, you're going to get infected, you're going to get drive by download, you're going to get some malware, it's going to cause you a problem. And, and then, you know, yeah, maybe uh, the attacker stays in to see what else he can feast off of in an environment. And usually that was within four walls and kind of mm -hmm. see what's around. Now, mm -hmm. it, you know, that started to, to progress uh, kind of in two directions. You had the ones who were opportunistic who said, I'm going to do things like encrypt all the systems and I'm going to ask for ransom, right? Those, those more opportunistic. But then mm -hmm. the ones who actually get penetration and have a goal. And, uh, you know, first they're going to infect a machine uh, that, you know, phishing and those things were just coming around back then as, as big problems. Mm -hmm. um, but either way, they want to get access to a person or a system. And in the old school environment, that was, I want to get access to a system so that I can then recon the environment. I'm going to establish mm -hmm. some persistence. I'm going to recon, you know, recon the entire environment. I'm going to find higher value assets that I can then move to. I'm going to find mm -hmm. higher value accounts that I can get access to or figure out how to elevate my uh, privilege to the account I already have access to, to get access to more data. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so then, you know, that was the espionage, the, you know, the standard type of stuff. But then it turned into more, you know, exfiltration and ransom of data, uh, those types of things. Um, now, a lot of those things still hold true. I mean, somebody wants to get access to a system. But when we were talking about the identity being the thing, what they really want is access to that identity. Um, there may not be four walls for them to peruse anymore, right? If they do mm -hmm. a, a network scan or a reconnaissance, they're going to discover a bunch of Xboxes and, and tablets for the kids mm -hmm. and stuff in the environment they got access to. So now it's all about getting access to a set of credentials. Um, and that could be through phishing. I mean, you've seen t tons of articles about the, the M365 spoofed logins that they try to get people to log in, get access to those credentials, and then they're either going to go through email and set up like forwarding rules so that they could be forwarded all the emails and find access to, to you know, more important things uh, in the environment or use those credentials that they've gotten to then attempt to access a cloud solution, um, something of higher value, right? So that's the new kind of lateral motion. It's, it's, it's not lateral motion throughout an environment. It's more lateral motion throughout all of the different accounts uh, or resources that somebody might, might be using. So while it's changed, the fundamentals, right, can still be identified the same way, um, but what they're after is different. And, and unfortunately, like you said, that now we've moved to, to cloud, um, you know, we've moved to storing a lot of our data in the cloud. Um, sometimes those, those ramifications can be pretty big. Um, so yeah, I, it, now it's, it's more about getting access to a set of credentials and then seeing what you can do with those. I mean, we've seen those in recent attacks, um, even the, you know, the best security and, and people have implemented the newest, you know, multi-factor and all of that, but they take advantage of the human element. They get the credentials and then they start, uh, what do they call it? Push bombing or whatever, just continually throwing push requests at somebody at midnight until they finally say, yes, God, leave me alone. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, that, and that's, that's a pretty common one, which is surprising to me. And, and hopefully we talk about that later, because I think it's very important and a responsibility of the security teams um, to take that kind of stuff into account and make sure that they're not spending thousands of dollars, tens of thousands, millions of dollars on security, only to be circumvented by somebody that doesn't know any better. Right. Mm. Yeah, but, wow. Yeah. So I could talk for days about this stuff. It's fascinating <laughs> to me. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you want to finish with a final thought on that? Um, you mean with the uh, the the attack chain? Uh, no, I thought you were just uh, going to say something just now. Just wondering. Oh no, um, no, honestly, um, you know, it, what it really boils down to is having understanding your attack surface and mm -hmm. the risk level, um, making sure that you're monitoring those things. Mm -hmm. And having a way to then audit the, you know, any results or any activities that do occur, and then a plan to resolve those. And that's, oh, yeah. that's yeah. pretty standard so we'll, incident yeah. response. Yeah, we'll get to the right? solutions in a bit. I just want to touch a little bit more on the problems before we sure. get there. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, so who, 
who i mean like who's responsible at the end of the day you know we we talk a lot about shared responsibility right with the cloud and uh, the the cloud vendors push that uh, a lot saying you know it's shared responsibility does that hold true with security uh, what does it mean for security the shared responsibility idea uh, it very much means a lot for security i mean if you talk about a team who's making use of a cloud resource versus the the cloud provider themselves you know, their job, obviously, there's the physical security and the data centers and all of those things. It's very important. Um, and preventing, you know, unauthorized access from, from different means to your cloud resources. Yes, those things are their responsibility, right? But then at the end of the day, once, you know, you've got that, what I call that authentication tunnel to your resources, um, it's up to you as a security team to make sure that the identity and access management and the data behind it is protected properly. And that's 100% on the security team. So I would argue when you talk about shared responsibility model, it is mostly about security and that it is you know, equally the responsibility of the person utilizing the resources to understand you know, the, the risk that the data being accessed presents, who should have access, when, how, and, and, and why. I mean, those are all things that the security people have to answer. That doesn't come off your plate just because mm -hmm. you're using AWS or Google Compute, right? It's still, you have to have that plan before you, you go into uh, to a cloud resource. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. And you know, when it comes to that, that taking on that responsibility for the security team and even for just you know, developers or anyone else who, you know, has some responsibility in the whole security thing, uh, you know, what would you say is a bigger problem? Is, is it that, you know, strategically, you know, the organization, you know, hasn't invested enough in security and that results in a lot of, uh, you know, risks? Or would you say that, you know, um, it's uh, irrespective of that, you know, there's so much that so many mistakes that happen because of human error and those are the big ones that, you know, uh, cause most of the, the security breaches and vulnerabilities, which do you say is a bigger concern? Well, I, you know, if, if that were just a question, I would have to argue the answer to all the questions is yes, right? I mean, <laughs> it, it, it depends Both. on the breach in the situation, right? <laughs> right. I mean, at, at the end of the day, um, yes, there are a lot of organizations that say we don't invest enough in security. But it's not mm -hmm. just not investing, you know, the, the manpower and the money. It's also to your point, you said about the developers, right? Their, their job is to produce a thing, you know, whatever that thing is, depending on what they're developing. And mm -hmm. there's generally a timeline associated with that and a need for this thing to be done. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, that can bypass the security requirements or at least not deeply invest with the security team who might be fully staffed to make sure that they're aware in doing evaluations, right? Uh, you, you know, I've seen that a lot in, in a lot of different orgs. Um, but at the same time, you know, for, for a long time, a couple of years, the, the discussion was around, you know, make sure you secure your S3 buckets, how many of these things have been mm -hmm. found publicly available, um, which, you know, in a, in a case like that, that's human error, right? I've, I've made a mistake yeah. or a developer has, has flipped it to, to open to do some testing and then forgot to, 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 to set those permissions back. So it, that's what I mean about all mm -hmm. of those things, right? And that's, that's why, you know, working closely with your security team, whoever's responsible for security is, is super important. Um, yeah, it's going to slow you down. But let me tell you, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who've dealt with breaches who wish they'd slowed down a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. I think that's a great answer. Uh, you know, just um, before we move on to talking a little bit, little bit about the industry and what's happening out there, just the last point on, you know, the problem, uh, you know, what would you say for our listeners who are listening who want like, a, you know, something they can take away quick with them, make a note of, you know, what would you say are the top one or the top three things that they could check if they're doing wrong today uh, in terms of their, you know, uh, their IAM or their SSO, you know, these the things that, you know, we're talking about. Sure. So, I mean, when you talk about IAM and SSO, they almost feel, uh, you know, SSO is a component of IAM, right? But, uh, you know, it is the way that you can then supply access to the resources that you, you know, you're, you're measuring identity, you're creating identity, you're making them members of groups, you're giving them certain privileges and permissions, and then using SSO to supply that, right? Um, I, I would say there's, there's a couple of mistakes that I think people make when they're kind of planning these types of things. Um, understanding one, um, the, you know, the conditional nature that you can now leverage with a lot of these solutions. Um, you know, it's not all the same. You're not simply just just making it easier for a user. That's one component of it. 
uh, to give them one password, right? But you're also then saying, well, I want to make it easier for a user in the happy path circumstance. I want to put barriers in when you know they're not mm-hmm. in their normal environment or using a machine. And, and you know, we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, too, here in a bit about zero trust. But you know, it, it's making sure you have the right types of dynamic policies um, depending on the situation. Um, the mm-hmm. second one goes back to what we were talking about, about the, uh, the, the, the push bombing and those kind of things. M- not educating the users, assuming that the users aren't technically savvy enough to spend time training them, um, I think is, is a risk, right? It's like, well, I'm just going to give them SSO and a portal and, and they're good to go. But, you know, in the situation where these people fell victim to like the, the push bombing, did they at any time say, what should you do if you receive a notification in the middle of the night asking for access when you know you didn't make it? What are the right steps to do? Um, This goes back to kind of always when you're in security, it's very tempting to say, I'm the expert, I'm going to design the system and I'm going to roll it out and you will comply, which I get it. But at the same time, there's a key component there that, that you miss and that's the why always communicate the why first. And yes, you have to do it in a way that the users understand. But if they understand what's at stake at that level, maybe they're not going to be so tempted to just tap that thing to shut it up and, and approve access via MFA. Um, you know, Instead, they're going to say, this is weird. I didn't do this. I'm going to change my password and I'm going to alert IT to a potential issue, right? Um, so I think not, you know, not educating the users on what all of this stuff entails, I think is a miss that a lot of organizations do. They just simply implement it, which actually means you end up with more resentment and resistance to the things that you try to implement. Mm, all right, great. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, you know, um, very, uh, I think, quick summary of, you know, what push bombing is and even what you can do to uh, protect against it. And, you know, I'd like to segue from that into... Just today, you know, the world as it is, remote work and, you know, um, networking is a lot more complex now. Um, you know, attacks have changed, you know, with the pandemic and stuff. You know, what, what are some of the changes you've seen in terms of device management in the past two years? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, you know, that we've been talking about the move to cloud for a decade, right? And, and there were two camps. For a long time, you know, cloud resources, how easy it is to spool things up, uh, you know, the the kind of scalability that you have, availability that you have, and all of these things. But then there was a camp that still kind of resisted that, and they're like, you know, I really like my stuff inside the walls. I've got an Active Directory server that's protected. I've got all of these things behind firewalls and. I feel better about that. I feel like I have more control. Truth is you never did because of shadow IT and how easy it was to to create cloud resources and use them. But then this move to everybody going home and trying to figure out how to work. Well, which camp do you think was caught more by surprise, right? (laughs) Clearly the ones who were kind of hugging their servers and saying everything has to live here. Uh, But I, I would say that was the biggest challenge that everybody faced is what do we do in a world where the walls don't matter? Um, you know, and that expensive firewall, it doesn't matter as much. I mean, sure, you had people who were, you know, okay, well, I'm going to set up some good VPN and, and, and remote access, and I'm going to send everybody back into the organization that way and make sure they do it securely now. But you had devices that, you know, all t- different types of devices that were being used for that. You had much less control over that. Um, and at the same time, you know, in this day and age, you know, three quarters of the things that people are using were cloud anyway. So you're making them go back into your four walls through a tunnel, just to tunnel them right back out to another cloud resource. Um, so you're essentially hosting traffic for somebody else. Um, you know, and sure, some people were inspecting that traffic and, and taking action, but depending on the size of the organization and, and budget available, some of those things weren't happening. So either way, I think what people realized is I've got people in the cloud accessing resources in the cloud, uh, and very rarely do they need anything internally. Um, I work with a lot of uh, managed service providers that, that supply services mm-hmm. for businesses, and mm-hmm. uh, one of them made a comment in the meeting I was in with him, and, and he's like, you know, after this, I want to make it so none of my clients ever have to be tied to a physical location again, you know, regardless of what happens. So, you know, situations like that, yeah, it, it's totally different now. It's now it's, okay, what hostile environment are these systems coming from that are accessing my data and how can I make sure they're mm-hmm. secure? So, 
you know, it went back from kind of watching the in and out traffic to just making sure that the core things, the device, the user, the, the traffic uh, in, in, in between and, and then auditing the access became so much more important than, than a lot of the other things. Mm. Yeah, and I, th I was quite intrigued by what you're talking about, which is, you know, the firewall has changed. It's no longer perimeter security. And right. you're even talking about zero trust uh, security. You know, I'd like if you could just uh, flesh that out a bit more. You know, what does it mean, zero trust? And what does it mean that, you know, the perimeter is broken and that now, you know, I guess it's, uh, you know, it's security at every level and at every segment. You know, you could, you could talk more on, on, if you could talk more on that, how is this, what, what does this change mean? Yeah, it, it does. I mean, it, zero trust has been around for a while, right? As a term, I mean, it's you know, it's been mm -hmm. since like 2010 uh, that the Forrester um, thing came out, and it was actually discussed before that, right? As more of a concept of, um, you know, making sure that you you don't inherently trust anything. There was a day when if you assumed that they got past your physical physical security, they got logged into the network, then you know what? They can access a file share. They can access some of these resources. It's okay. They made it through the first few layers, uh, but you know, as we talked about, attackers moving laterally. I mean, if they get access to to any credentials, they they have keys to the kingdom, right? Um, so you know, yeah. the, the the thought process started to turn towards. Well, you know what? You need to verify every connection, every mm. attempt, um, and and it's more than just did they get the password right? You know, uh, the username and password. It was. Um, okay, are they using a system that I know is protected? Um, are they then, you know, because the vulnerabilities on the endpoint and, and, and all the things that come with that. Um, so is it protected? Uh, have they proven that they are who they say they are? Are they coming from where I expect them to come through? Do they have the rights to access this data, right? So, you know, the term they th that they threw in the Forrester thing was, you know, trust nothing, verify everything. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a great way of kind of talking about it. But in, in today's age, zero trust is making sure, like I said, that the user, number one, uh, is who they say they are. Mm -hmm. They're on a device that you trust and you manage because then you can own the security level of that device. Mm -hmm. Are they coming from a place, location, network, that kind of thing uh, that you would expect them to if they're not, have you challenged them with an additional form of authentication that makes them prove that it's them, right? That's the multi-factor component. Um, and then, then, and only then after all of those things, that's the authentication component. Then you have the authorization component. What applications do I give them access to um, through SSO and all of that? So really zero trust is about going from that user all the way up through the device, through the channel, where are they coming from? Uh, you know, what are they attempting to access? Do they have permission? Um, so multiple points of verification, the ability to audit all of that so that you can then go back and deconstruct an event if something happened, right? Um, collecting that and then having a plan to adjust that uh, if you need, right? Tighten up security, change your, uh, change your policies uh, based on, you know, new information that you found from a new attempt or a new attack. Uh, to me, that's zero trust. It's that whole piece. Yeah, I love that. I mean, and for listeners, you know, if, if there's anything so far that you have to take note of, if you have to write down, uh, I would say it's just this, uh, this uh, you know, description that Gil just gave us, which is, uh, you know, talking about the user, the uh, device, the location, and then if you need to do another check uh, in another way to verify. I think this is really the crux of it. I think this is a really important point that Gil had made. And uh, yeah, I think that really boils it down, I think, in a few words and, you know, in, in a really crisp format, I think, you know, user device location and then something like MFA. So I think that's really awesome. Yeah. The only thing uh, I might add to that is the criticality of the data they're attempting to access, right? Like what group mm -hmm. are they and, and how critical is the data? Because that matters too. Maybe I challenge somebody who wants access to a GitHub repository with an extra factor, but if somebody just wants access to their, you know, HR application or Zoom, maybe I don't need to challenge them for that, right? So it's that whole, you know, dynamic decision-making based on the criticality. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, for some listening to this, you know, it'll sound probably tedious, you know, how do you set up checks at every point? You know, who's got the time to do all that? <laughs> so, you know, how, how, how does that, how is that, how does that work, you know, in these modern systems today? And, you know, um, do policies, you know, come into play, you know, security policies, networking policies, is that one of the answers, you know, what else is the answer? Could you shed some light on 
Uh, practically, sure. what, how, do you, how do you implement this stuff? Well, people solve it in different ways, right? I mean, di different vendors or, or, or suppliers might supply, uh, supply these in different ways. Sometimes it is at the network level. And I see that more at the enterprise side where they still do have four walls and tons of network traffic. And, the, you know, so you could do it at that network level and pull the authentication off the wire and measure all that traffic and all that. But that's not really necessarily efficient for, for smaller organizations, more nimble organizations, more cloud first organizations that don't necessarily anchor themselves. Um, so in cases like that, I, I would say it's the identity and access management along with the single sign-on multi-factor authentication. Uh, and yeah, it's by policy, right? I mean, if you think about identity and, and what it is, right? It's a thing, it's an object and the object has attributes. And some of those attributes are, well, what do you do? What groups are you in? Uh, and then you can say, well, by that policy, I want the users in these groups to have access to these types of resources. I want them to have access to these types of resources and not have access to these types of resources. So defining the policies, both for like the user groups that they're members of or the user themselves, but also having policies based on the devices, right? Uh, you know, I, I could have a different experience if I use my work computer to log into something than if I use my home laptop to log into that same resource. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it is all about the policies and, and it's all about, you know, you'll hear it referred to as conditional access uh, because of those things. The conditions have to be met for me to supply you with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, uh, policies, you know, can be implemented easily in a closed system, you know, in a, in a small system. But then, you know, today, uh, you know, the attack surface is really expanding, especially, you know, when we're talking about hybrid and multi-cloud, uh, you know, setups. So, you know, how do policies get applied in these complex setups where it's not just one cloud platform you're dealing with, you've got multiple systems on premise. Uh, so, you know, how, how does that change things? Well, I mean, again, it's, it's that you have to have some logical organization, right? I mean, I know, you know, you talk about Active Directory and kind of how it grew over time to be this set of like crazy nested policies with all of these details involved. And, um, and that was good. When, when you're in the environment, when you're outside of the environment, it's really tough because if you want people to authenticate to that and, and get permissions, then you have to punch holes back into that network. Um, but at the same time, yeah, you have to, you have to measure, right? You have to know uh, like a device. How do I know that this is a managed device? Well, it probably has to have a certificate right? So that it can then authenticate upstream. So you have to, you know, implement a, a certificate on the device. Um, you get something on the device there where, you know, it, like in, in our world, in jump cloud world, you can actually set it up so that when, when somebody logs into their computer, they're using their jump cloud directory service credentials. They didn't have to be created in, in active directory or another directory service. They could be if you wanted to integrate, but you could also have Jump Cloud is the directory and it goes all the way down to the device. You log in with that Jump Cloud identity. It verifies the, the system, make sure that you have the rights to that system and what level of access you have to that system, right? Are you a standard user? Are you an admin user? That kind of thing. And then let that flow upstream into requests that you're making to um, any applications that a, a user has been assigned that would be in your group, right? So, or that user group's been assigned. So, you know, it's all about making sure that you have things in the right places to kind of pass those conditional checks um, and then logging all of it too. That's really important. Mm -hmm. So probably a lot of people today have uh, their management plane, you know, in uh, one of the cloud vendors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so what would you say is the case for, you know, adding on a standalone, um, you know, SSO IAM service? Uh, you know, what would you say is the case for that? And, you know, for someone listening, they may say, why should I, you know, complicate it further? I like it simple. Why don't I just, you know, use just this much? What would you say is the case for saying, hey, it's not more complex, but this is actually good. You know, what would you say is the case for that? Well, so the challenge is, you know, you have all of these different vendors that you might use, and some of them have some identity and access management. Um, but but what I, I've found a lot of times is that they are still more centric to that solution. Okay. Um, right. I mean, you, you know, you talk mm -hmm. about Active Directory, obviously, yeah. it's a window shop type of thing, and it's really painful to hook other stuff up. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you talk about, you know, your Azure AD and things. Yes, they, they do have some MVM capabilities, but they are still kind of focused on keeping you in their ecosystem. 
Um, mm-hmm. You know, but then you have things like, you know, if somebody wants to start a shop and they, they you know, G apps, uh, Google Mail, it's a very rudimentary directory. Um, you know, so every one of them has its benefits and its disadvantages. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, that's at Jump Cloud, we were like, you know, there's got to be a better way. So, yes, you can have Jump Cloud be your directory. It holds those objects and, and all of the attributes about those, but you can also integrate it with something you're already using. Right. If you're using some other, you know, even like an, think about an HR system where you, that's actually the first place somebody creates a user in most organizations. Mm-hmm. Right. So you can feed it from, you know, from, uh, from Google, from you know, those identities can be imported from Active Directory or Azure AD, but then they get the benefit of having that one user portal where someone can log in and see all of the apps that they've been assigned, the cloud apps that may have nothing to do with the identity provider or the vendor of that, right? All of those different apps via SAML and, you know, the integrations, um, but also internal resources using LDAP, which is really cool. Um, that's something that a lot of people mm-hmm. don't do is that using LDAP, we can grant you access to the internal resources that can use LDAP too. Um, so the good mm-hmm. hybrid mix, uh, doesn't matter mm-hmm. what operating system you're using, right? Um, all the different operating systems, uh, we're very agnostic there. So the idea is that, you know, bring all of this information in, synchronize it with, with Jump Cloud. Uh, let Jump Cloud then present the user with a portal that lets them kind of manage their, their password and authentication. And they can do self-service password resets right from there. And it will then synchronize to those others. But the idea is that it does bring all these things together, give you access to you know, all of the different resources that you're, you're configuring, uh, give you a, w- a way to log it and manage it all the way from the device, but also on the device, make sure you're uh, supplying the right policies. Um, we have policies that you can apply much like a, a group policy type of thing, security policies, make sure that the device is encrypted, turn off your, your USB uh, storage devices, that kind of thing. A lot of the things that you can do, and you can do that with Mac, you can do it with Windows, you can do it with Linux. So all of those security policies to, to make sure that the system is secure, um, you can even ensure that the operating systems are patching and staying up to date, right? So there's less vulnerabilities. Then once they've authenticated on a device that you trust and that you've secured, then you can grant them access to those applications and then pass through like, you know, example, you know, if, if, for example, AWS has a very complex identity and access management scheme, but you can use attributes within uh, those integrations to then supply them upstream with the right role in AWS. So you get kind of the best of all of those worlds. You get the benefits of some of those other IAM components, use the attributes to pass those up through Jump Cloud and still have the ability to audit kind of everything, at least that source of authentication in one place. So um, yeah, that's that's what we do. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I was going to just ask you more about Jump Cloud, but I think yeah, you covered quite a bit. <laughs> I jumped on the opportunity. <laughs> eh? <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, but just uh, to extend a little more from that, you know, let's say someone chooses Jump, Jump Cloud, what would you say is like the ideal picture of, you know, uh, an attack that's in progress? What's it like for a Jump Cloud customer? How is it different from someone who is, let's say, you know, not so advanced in their, you know, uh, their journey? Uh, with with all of this, what, what well, we all want to say, out? you know, we we always want to say, well, you know, that that is less likely to happen if you're doing good IAM and and um, you know conditional access policies and those kind of things. Like somebody gets access to, you know, let's talk about that what we talked about earlier. Somebody gets access to credentials, right? They're going to try to use those credentials um, somewhere. Um, now, if they're using SSO and you've got all of those SSO apps uh, set to look to the identity provider for authentication, let's say they try to use those credentials from outside that jump cloud path of authentication. Well, if you've configured the SSO app to always look to jump cloud, where are they going to be redirected? Right back to our user portal where they're going to attempt to log in from some location and they're going to, our conditional access says, "Mm -mm, MFA, please which is not going to succeed. So, you know, the idea is it's another layer that reduces the attack surface uh, inbound. Um, Now, at the same time, you may have a lot of failed logins from some of these attempts. Uh, We have something called directory insights where we're logging all of this activity. You could actually go in and say, you know, you can see over time how many failed logins you have. Uh, You know, we present a chart uh, graph over time of that, and you should see spikes very easily if you're under attack. 
then you should know. Then you'll know what accounts are attempting to be logged into, right? The, the, the frequency, where they came from. Um, so you can make better decisions about what actions to take next. We're going to tighten up our security. We're going to go deeper on um, the conditional access and always require MFA until we're confident this is passed. Uh, have people change their passwords. Um, you know, the things that the defensive things that you need to do when it comes to identity. Mm -hmm. Great. And, you know, for some of our listeners thinking, okay, I'm going to check out Jump Cloud, you know, sounds interesting. What would you say is the, you know, the getting started uh, phase, like, you know, how long does it take to get set up? How much of it is, you know, uh, just, you know, figuring out configuration, changing up things, you know, how much do you have to move from one to another, one place to another, repurpose, translate, all of that. Is there a lot of setup or what, what's it like? What's the onboarding like? I mean, you can you can easily start, uh, you know, a, 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 an instance of Jump Cloud, um, mm -hmm. create some test users, and kind of uh, poke around. But the thing that's important um, is that yes, we do supply a lot of the tools mm -hmm. uh, for you to bring in identities um, to you know, so that you're not having to do a lot of importing, exporting. You can certainly import via you know spreadsheet or CSV or whatever, but also uh, connections to a lot of these other sources, so you can import that information rather okay. quickly. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea is you bring it in, but we also mm -hmm. have a lot of out of the box suggested configurations. Right. Okay. Uh, we don't want you to figure everything out from scratch. Um, you Could know, you a great example. An example of like, what, yeah, it's yeah, a great one. And patch policies, one. patch management yeah. policies, right? That's a big one, right? You need to figure out what you want to do. We actually have suggested groups. And, and, you know, if you think about how people roll out patches, there's an early adopter group. Right. And then there's the, you know, the, the Vanguard group after them or Vanguard then early adopter and then the rest. And the idea is think about it like rings. We actually create policies with those suggested time frames and delays right out of the box so that you can then move those devices into the right policies rather than figure it all out on your own. Um, uh, we do a lot of suggested group membership based on resources that you've been uh, giving to individual users. Maybe you should make them a member of this group because they already have access to these things. So we, we try to make that a lot easier through the process um, as, as you kind of bring in these identities. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of that guided kind of suggestion along the way. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Great. Yeah, those, that's a great example. Um, and, you know, as we wind up, you know, just uh, one of the last questions on this topic is, you know, as you look ahead next uh, five years or so, what do you see happening in this space? What excites you the most? Uh, yeah, what's what's around the corner, uh, you know, in, in this space? Uh, could you comment a bit on that? You know, it's hard. It's it's very hard sometimes to predict the future because, you, you know, you have this vision of what you see things are going to be like. And then something comes out of left field and it's like, wow, nobody ever thought about that. And suddenly, you know, there's this pace of change and then there's this spurt or rapid, you know, growth. But so it's hard. But, you know, I would argue, I mean, if you look at what's going on today with hardware keys, biometrics, um, you know, the concern about this password as a thing that can be stolen, um, you know, the passwordless authentication, you're starting to hear noise about that already. Other mechanisms to verify you are who you say you are. I mean, hopefully it doesn't get to the point where you have to have a chip in your brain, but mm -hmm. you, you know, you get my drift. It's, it's having other ways to prove who you are without having to constantly remember all of these things that if you have to remember it, someone else could probably steal it. So I think that's where we're going to see. I mean, you know, by, by then, uh, there won't be something you can log into that doesn't have an extra factor in some, and that's going to be the norm. It already is, really. But then after that, it's going to be what other mechanisms can you use to define um, a person as an object, right? you know, without having to remember the password. I think we're going to see it go heavily into that range as well. All right. Awesome. So with that, we wind up with our, uh, a conversation on uh, these topics of directory management and IAM and SSO and all of this. So we, we're going to end with a few fun questions for Gil to sort of get to know him a little more. Uh, so Gil, uh, yeah, just a few questions and then we're done. Okay. So uh, yeah, the first one, uh, what would be an alternate career path for you if not for your job in tech? So uh, that's a great story. I had a plan uh, when I was younger. Um, mm -hmm. I was a musician. I'm still a musician, technically, oh, awesome. but uh, I play all kinds of instruments in a bunch of different bands. I got into recording. I really thought I was going to be a recording engineer and producer. 
Uh, oh, I, I was I was literally ready to sign the lease on a space to start recording when the train went by out back, and I realized that wasn't going to work because you can't record with a train going by. Um, but also the the cost of studio time was so low. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to make it. So I, I, I was almost a uh, producer. <laughs> wow. Okay. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of a musician too. I play bass guitar. What do you play by the way? I mean, you said you I'm, play a I, bunch of instruments. I play uh, bass. I have an upright bass, oh, uh, I, oh, I man. electric bass, uh, guitar. I have drums. I play drums, uh, a little bit of keyboards. I wouldn't perform in front of anybody, but uh, I sing, play bass, guitar, and drums, and I've done that in different bands. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Multi-instrumentalist. <laughs> um, yeah, so what's one work tool that you can't live without? A work tool that I can't live My giant monitor. Um, oh, okay. I have a widescreen monitor, the double size type with the curve okay. so, on them. I don't know, how many um, inches is it? Oh, I, I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> 30, so I didn't know, 40? Okay. Maybe? I don't know. It's giant. It's, it's, oh, yeah, it fills cool. up my entire wall just about. <laughs> but, I, you know, I started with, you know, everybody had one monitor, then two monitors. Now I have three, and one of them is that giant monitor. And oh. I, don't, I, I don't think I could do my job without it as many different windows as I have open anymore. <laughs> Amazing. Um, the next one. When are you most productive? Oddly enough, I find myself mostly productive in the early morning hours. And I mean, that's oh, generally okay. before people wake up. Um, if I wake up at like four in the morning and can't go back wow. to sleep and I sit down, for some reason, I get in more of a zone then. It's quiet. It's peaceful. There's less noise in the atmosphere, I guess. And, and I find myself more productive then. Oh, okay. Most, most productive. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Favorite tech blog or writer or website? Bonus points if you say amazing. Um, well, I, I will now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I spend a lot of time on a lot of different sites, as most people in this age do. Um, but one of my favorites to read, since I'm a security guy, I always have been at heart, um, you know, like Krebs on security, Brian, uh, the, the Krebs uh, site, Krebs on security. I read that one a lot. Uh, looks like it's okay. Looks like we froze for a second. Yeah, I think I have a thunderstorm rolling in. No, it says my internet connection is unstable. Oh, anyway. Okay. Seem to be fine doing now. fine so far. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Uh, a book that you'd recommend everyone read. So again, I'm going to go with that security. Um, the Fifth Domain by Richard A. Clark, uh, who was a you know cyber uh, terrorism advisor and cybersecurity guy for 20 years in different uh, White House. Uh, I think it's fan It's fascinating. When you you read all about uh, all of the cybersecurity efforts and failures and successes uh, that that different countries have had, but it's also kind of terrifying when you read sections about um, infrastructure and how vulnerable it is to cyber attacks and those types of things. But it's a really good read to understand the mind of somebody whose job it is doing this for an entire country, right? And, and understanding uh, some of those things that are out there. So that's one of my wow. favorites. Really interesting. I should check that out. Uh, your last question, uh, what was the last thing you Googled? I don't know if you remember it right away. That's funny. I do, actually. So okay. I'm going to exclude all the work things because, you know, in my line of work, yeah. you're Googling things all day, trying to find stuff <laughs> and, and, and locate things. The last non-work thing I Googled was um, a rare vinyl uh, oh. album prices. <laughs> because I was going through my album collection. I have all these weird like picture discs, you know, the albums with the pictures on them and all of that, that I've picked up different places, a metallic album recorded live that was never released, things like that. I was just looking to see what they were worth these days because wow. it's been years since I pulled them out. So you got a vinyl player. Is it one of the antique ones or is it a more modern one? It's a more modern one. I, you know, yeah. I, there was a time in my life where I had, yeah, I wanted to spend the the real money on a really nice record player. Um, but in this day and age, you can get access to music so many different ways. They kind of stay on my shelf, and I have just kind of a basic record player that'll allow you to uh, burn to CD, that kind of thing. <laughs> awesome, great! Thanks so much, Gil. That was a really informative talk and a lot of fun. And I'm sure our listeners, uh, you know, are quite. Uh, uh, happy about all of the ideas you shared, really interesting. Uh, so uh, to wrap up, uh, everyone listening, please head over to amazic.com for more content like this. We've got articles, we've got 
videos, we've got event coverage, we even got job listings. So, uh, you know, go there if you want to really stay up to date on what's happening in the space. Uh, so with that, thank you so much, Gil. It was great. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you again. Dwayne, thank you for having me. Take care.